All right, why don't we get started? So thanks for joining Mark Lamonic. I look after the individual investor team from Morningstar in Australia. Today, we're going to talk about how to respond and a lot how not to respond to market downturns. But before we get started, a couple housekeeping items. Anything you hear today is general advice. I obviously don't know anything about you, so I can't offer personal advice. If you're over in New Zealand, you can get a copy of our um FAP on our website, morningstar.com.au, and the New Zealand regulatory authorities would encourage you to speak to a financial advisor if you want personal advice. A um, couple other things. Anyone who had registered for Tuesday's webinar, apologies about that. I'm actually up in Bangkok right now, and my love of street food got the best of me, so I wasn't feeling very well on Tuesday, but sorry about missing that session. Also, this is the last webinar in this series. We will get started again in October, so we'll send out a schedule uh, shortly on uh, on those dates and the new webinars. You can, of course, listen to our podcast in the meantime, follow us on Instagram, and another exciting event for October, you can come to our conference. So Shawnee put together an amazing lineup of speakers. The focus is really on all of you as investors, we're going to walk through basically Morningstar's view on how to invest. So everything from setting goals to asset allocation to hearing from a number of CIOs, so chief investment officers around what to do in this environment. And once again, a CIO is very much like all of us as individual investors, right? We can allocate our money anywhere and get to make decisions about where we're actually going to put it and look at different opportunities. So I think it's a great lineup. Send me an email, mark.lamonica1 at morningstar.com. I'll give you a special rate on the conference. All right. So let's talk about bear markets. So we'll talk in general about bear markets. We'll talk a little bit about what's going on now. Then we'll talk about some different ways that people think and try to respond to downturns that... Uh, that aren't very effective. So anyway, bear markets in general. So of course, a bear market occurs when an index falls 20% or more, obviously. So when it hits that 20% mark from a market peak to, uh, to whatever date that happens, that's when a bear market officially starts. A bear market ends, of course, when a new high is made. Um, so that's the market retracing those steps and then making a new high. So since 1928, as you can read the S&P 500, it's had 27 bear markets. So they've happened every 3.5 years. So what is happening right now is not in any way unusual, but it certainly feels unusual because we haven't had a lot of bear markets recently. And I can go and in, in the next slide will actually show a little bit of history of where, uh, of where they are. So as you can see, around 9.6 months is the average length of the bear market. So of course, that's once again, until the market makes another high. It does mean that we, of course, have some time to go um, if this is an average bear market. And then you can see the loss is 19 months. You don't actually know that a bear market is over um, because you won't know that it's hit a bottom until it makes a new high. So all of this, of course, is just looking back historically. So an important point that we're gonna make that I'm going to make a couple times today is that this last bullet point right there. So half of the S&P 500 strongest days in the last 20 years occurred during a bear market. So as of course, there during bear markets, there is a lot of volatility. And as you start to see recoveries, and we'll talk about recoveries, you can have very, very good days. And it is important to stay invested. So, of course, you can take advantage of that. But we'll spend some more time talking about that. All right. Brief uh, brief history of bear markets since 1960. So, as you can see, there really has not been a lot recently. There's, of course, been this COVID dip. But that happened so quickly that... Well, many people noticed it. That happened so quickly that it really wasn't a typical bear market that kind of grinds away at investors and causes a lot of the poor decision making that we'll talk about a little bit later. So you can see uh, you can see the history and of course the duration. So even though we did look at the average and see some are quite long. 
All right, so let's talk about what you should do. And let, I guess let's talk a little bit about what's happening. So, you know, we have hit a bear market in the US. The Australian market has not fallen 20% yet. So technically we are not in a bear market locally. Um, we did hit a bear market earlier this year in the US when we passed through that 20% threshold. We've seen a bit of a rally over the past couple months. And then really on the back of Jerome Powell's speech two weeks ago, we've seen sort of a further dip in the market. And really, you know, what is basically happening is there's been a change in investor expectations around where interest rates would go, of course, what inflation has been. And we saw that cause that initial dip. And then I think there was uh, there was certainly a lot of optimism that somehow we were easily going to get out of this, that interest rate raises would slow and then stop and potentially start going down again next year, and that inflation had peaked. And then I think you know the speech that Jerome Powell had a couple of weeks ago where basically he came out and said, no, we are not slowing interest rate increases in uh, in the US. We will keep going and we will keep going until we crush inflation. I think caused the market to reassess that viewpoint that this was going to be some sort of rosy ending. So obviously none of us know what's going to happen, but those are the things that are happening in the uh, in the market right now. But let's talk about what people generally do during downturns and why it doesn't work. And that, of course, can get us into things that we can do that hopefully will be effective. So there is a, some conventional wisdom. And one of the things that I hear from a lot of people is that if everyone expects the market will continue to go down, why would you not just move to cash and then invest when it is quote unquote safer? And of course, we are inundated with bad news these days, right? So there's certainly the interest rate um, scenarios that I've been talking about. There's a lot of talk about those interest rate raises driving the economy into a recession. Um, of course, we're dealing with inflation. There's, of course, geopolitical tensions that are going on. Um, all sorts of bad news that, of course, spooks investors. So there is this notion, okay, well, if everything's going so poorly, I'll simply sell. And then at some point when it's safer, I'll get back in and I'll miss any associated market drops. The market drops that, of course, are predicted by a lot of different people. Now, this, of course, is a classic case of market timing. And anytime we talk about market timing, we need to sit there and look at, OK, why and how will we know when to get back in? And one of the really important things, and we'll have a slide next that discusses this, but one of the really important things is that you know the market is forward looking. And I think COVID is a perfect example. If we go back and we look at that COVID market drop. So obviously there was a lot of fear about what the impacts would be of COVID. We saw a very steep decline in the market. And then even though the COVID situation did not get better, and in many ways was a lot worse than I think all of us potentially predicted back in February and March of 2020, the market, of course, rallied. And what it was doing was, of course, looking past COVID and saying, OK, this will end at some point, and looking past it and looking at the economic recovery. So remember that the market's very forward-looking. And what that means is that when a new bull market starts, it will not feel like there is any good news. Um, so that's really the problem. Once the economy is back doing well, the market is likely already rallied and you've missed it. So it's very difficult to figure out when exactly to get back in. And then I think this Bank of America survey is pretty interesting that if you sit there and you are timing the market and happen to miss the best days, and you can see this, the 10 best days of each decade, there are giant differences in your return. So that's the danger of market timing that none of us know what's going to happen. So certainly you can go and read all sorts of predictions about what's going to happen with the market, um, but none of us actually know what's going to happen. And so if you are making extreme changes in asset allocation based on your expectations about what's going to happen in the future, you could be in trouble. So once again, it's very important to center those asset allocation decisions and the security selection decisions that you have around your goals. Um, so that is, uh, yeah, that's important. And yeah, good, uh, good comment by Tom. So follow Warren Buffett's advice to sell when people are euphoric and buy when everyone is fearful, at least with part of your portfolio, right? So yeah, doing the opposite of what may feel safe to you and what may, uh, what may 
be conventional wisdom is often a good move. And this is another example of the market certainly looking past current issues where, you know, the things that the market are, is looking at look very different from sort of what you're seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. And we can go back and we can look at the GFC. So the GFC extended a uh, very extreme fall in the market, market bottom from a U.S. perspective in March of 2009. Now, things looked terrible in March of 2009, but that's when the market started going up. And so as you can see that, you know, unemployment did not peak in the US until November. So it actually went up above 10% in November of that year, but the market rally started in March. And of course, we did not know that unemployment peaked at that point, of course. So all of this is hindsight. What we saw is a steadily increasing unemployment rate, obviously issues with the economy. Um, the economy was still in a recession when the market recovery started, but missing that recovery, missing that early part of the recovery in the GFC, cost you a lot. Um, so this is just another example of the market being forward looking. And this notion of getting back in when things feel safer, really pretty difficult to do. Um, so something, uh, something important that's uh, to look at. So Lisa is saying central banks cannot keep raising interest rates indefinitely, which ultimately will reset market performance. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I think obviously they can't raise them indefinitely. The one thing I would say is that, you know, I think that this notion, certainly kind of the notion that we had until two weeks ago when, you know, Jerome Powell came out and said, yeah, no, I am serious. And we've seen a lot of things happen this week in terms of uh, locally, in terms of interest rate rises and certainly the start of a political fallout from that with, uh, with the RBA and with Philip Lowe. But they can't raise interest rates indefinitely, but just be prepared for them to raise them higher than a lot of people think that they will go. Um, so we did a podcast that we released on Sunday, and we looked back on Paul Volcker, who headed up the Fed, and we looked at you know what kind of happened in the '70s and the early '80s, and you know those lessons that um, you know that basically central banks took their foot off the pedal and did not actually crush inflation, and instead once again, sort of bowed to political pressure and stopped raising interest rates, I think those lessons are burned into a lot of central bankers' heads right now um, that do not let up too early. And you're, you're seeing them actually talk about that. Certainly in the US, you've seen a number of the different, um, and Peter Warrens wrote about this, a number of the different um, regional bank governors in the US come out and actually talk about that and talk about that those are the lessons from the 70s and that inflation needs to be crushed, which means, yeah, I just be prepared, Lisa and everyone else, that interest rates may go higher than people think they actually will. All right. The other thing that I hear a lot is I hear that bonds move inversely to shares. And of course, they will go up when the share market's dropping. And it's very important to realize that that is not true at all. So I think that it's often sold, diversification is often sold as just that, right? That, okay, so you buy one asset that um, will go up in certain periods while another one goes down and then vice versa happens and you're balancing things out. That's not really what diversification is, right? Diversification is actually what it's doing is what it's supposed to do is eliminate your exposure to security specific risks and instead take on market risk because the market risk is over the long term that risk is what you're getting rewarded for with returns so removing security specific risk is very different than finding different assets that will actually counteract each other during uh during any period of the market so stocks and bonds often will move in the same direction. And we've seen that if we go back and we look back towards, um, you know, kind of the early 80s, but once again, sort of this Paul Volcker period uh, at the Fed when inflation was finally crushed, shares and bonds have both done very well and both performed very well. This year, they both dropped. And so when we talk a lot about interest rates, right, and we talk about the impact that rising interest rates have on valuation levels and have on share markets, it's important to remember that interest rates going up also make bonds go down. So, and that's just a mathematical relationship. So it's very important to realize what the purpose of bonds are in portfolios. And so, you know, 
and the reason that this is worrisome is because I hear once again with this whole thing that, okay, I'll move to cash. The other thing is people say, well, now's a really good time to buy bonds because the market's going down. Well, not necessarily, right? So interest rate rises, if they continue the market expectations of where interest rates are going, bonds will continue to fall. So just remember, they do not move inversely. Oftentimes they move together. Going back to 1927, as you see, the correlation between bonds, long-term bonds, and the share market has been close to zero, meaning there is no relationship between their returns. Um, and it can vary during different time periods. So once again, be very careful about that notion. And the purpose of putting bonds in your portfolio is to lower the volatility. Lowering the volatility does not mean that your portfolio will not go down and does not mean that both of them will go down. But over the long term, bonds tend to fall and rise less than shares. So that's going to lower that overall volatility in your portfolio. But that does not protect you from your portfolio going down, right? The only thing that can technically protect you unless you are shorting something or you're investing in some sort of inverse ETF or something like that. The only thing that can protect you really is cash. But once again, realize what's happening with cash right now. Of course, as inflation goes up, your cash actually, the purchasing power goes down. But that's the only thing that really has no volatility um, that will completely protect your portfolio. Um, all right, so let's, okay, the other thing you hear a lot, and frankly, this is something that you hear a lot from fund managers, is that during bear markets, investment selection really matters, right? So you hear this all the time. And, you know, I think a lot of people think this as well, and think, okay, so what I need to do now is I need to make adjustments in my portfolio. And so now's a great time to go and find stuff that has done well, right? And, you know, if we go back and we look at sort of what's done well this year, yeah, a lot of commodities, energy, things like that have done pretty decently. And so I think people believe that a bear market is an opportunity to sort of reset your portfolio. So once again, let's go through this. So we talk about what potentially you should do. But just remember that the volatility that's happening is increasing the likelihood that you, me, every other investor will make mistakes. So we do this survey called the Mind the Gap survey. And really what the survey looks at is it looks at the difference between investor returns and the returns of the underlying investment. And so the way that we can do this is we can measure inflows and outflows into funds, right? So we can measure when investors decide to invest in a certain fund, money going in, versus when investors decide to withdraw money from a certain fund, money going out. And we can, of course, compare that to how the underlying securities in that fund have done. And guess what? There is a gap. And what that gap represents is the poor decisions, the poor timing decisions that investors make. So this is, of course, a problem. And if we go back and we do the survey every six months, or we do the study every six months, and if we go back and we look at different time periods, we can see that during time periods when there are increases in volatility, when security prices are bouncing around more, that gap actually <coughs> that gap actually gets bigger. So, and you can of course read what it says on that uh, on that fourth bullet point on there, that if we look at equity funds and ETFs, we put them into five different quintiles by volatility, right? So how much do those investments bounce around? And we look at the first quintile and the last quintile, we can see that the gap is 10 times as large. So what does that mean? It means that when security prices are moving a lot, we tend to chase performance. And so that's exactly what this notion is around security selection. Oh, that, okay, I need to make adjustments to my portfolio because we're in a bear market. And just be very careful with that because oftentimes those adjustments will naturally be, okay, I will sell what's done really poorly and I'll go find something that's done well. And, you know, of course you can craft a narrative around why those investments did well and of course project that into the future. but you might have already missed it, right? So the time to invest in energy shares is probably during COVID when oil prices were very, very low. Um, a lot of the commodity prices were very, very low. Well, 
you might have missed that opportunity with the rally they've had. Now, obviously, I don't know where anything's going from now. Neither does anyone else. Um, but just remember that, you know, making those decisions and moving into things that did well, even if they have a good narrative, you might have already missed it. Same thing that we talk about at the broader market, right? That the market is forward looking. And in many cases, this notion of I'll get back in when things are safe is the exact same thing, right? You may have missed that rally um, because it started before you actually knew about it. So what can you do? I think that, of course, is the uh, is the question. And, you know, not to sound like a broken record again, but once again, I think a bear market is, of course, a good time as all times are, a good time to sit there and think again about the purpose of why you're investing and what you're trying to accomplish and make sure that you are lining up your objectives with a strategy for investing and then actually security selection. And hopefully that will prevent you from making some of these mistakes that uh that many people are making and that we've talked about during this uh, during this webinar. So we'll spend a uh, so we'll spend a second talking about that. Um, oh, looks like somebody already answered that question. Um, so we'll spend a second talking about that. So once again, what does this mean and what does it look like in a market like that? Well, for a market like this, well, setting a goal, of course, is ensuring that you have planned out what you actually are investing for. And that is that includes coming up with um, certainly the amount of money that you're going to need, the date that you need it, and working backwards and figuring out a rate of return that you need. That allows you to go into asset allocation. And then that eventually allows you to go in and select securities. So doing that, it's um, a good question, which I'll get to in one second. So doing that during any time that you're investing, but particularly in a bear market, keeps you focused on what you're trying to accomplish. And if you go through that process and you calculate your required rate of return, it also shows you that you shouldn't, that you shouldn't and hopefully won't do a lot of the bad behavior that we talked about, that you won't move to cash because you realize you do need to earn a return, that you won't sit there and... Um, reallocate all of your portfolio by trying to chase performance and you realize, okay, well, over the long term, this is what I need to achieve. Um, so a couple, uh, just a reminder that that is a good thing to do during any time, but especially in bear markets to keep you grounded on the long term and what you're trying to accomplish. So we do have a question, do good active fund managers perform better in times of bear markets than in other times? Um, no. I mean, at the end of the day, no. So what that is a industry. So what I would say is, you know, that is a um, sales pitch by the industry that, OK, in really poor markets, that's when you need to actually go out there and find active managers. But there is no evidence. There is no historic evidence that any of that is true. <laughs> um, so active managers have and of course there are certain managers that have outperformed but active managers have underperformed indexes in bull markets in bear markets in every market um so we of course go out there and look at uh look at performance of active versus passive across all different active uh, all different asset classes um so it's a report that we publish um that it's called the active passive barometer. And in all markets, active managers are underperforming. Now, of course, the sales pitch that you'll get is, oh, well, that's the average active manager. Are there some that outperform? Of course there are. There are certain active managers outperform, but there is no evidence in aggregate that active managers do any better during bear markets. Um, and so, you know, and I think we can just sort of look back on sort of what's, what has happened Um with this current bear market that, you know, this was not, of course, predicted by central bankers did not think, think of last year, all of last year, we were told by everyone from central bankers on down that inflation was transitory, interest rates were not going up. A lot of the, you know, sort of political fallout that's happening right now um, around the RBA is, of course, the statements that Lowe made that interest rates weren't going up until 2024. Um, and, well, well, I won't inject my own opinions here, but, you know, that is just a case of, you know, once again, 
nobody really saw this coming. And all of us, whether we're fund managers, whether we're central bankers, all of us have a recency bias where we just believe that what has recently happened will continue to happen, right? So whether it's investors, whether it's central bankers, thought that, you know, we will not have inflation because we have not had inflation in a long time, where I think now people are taking um, a different look at what's happening and realizing that maybe some fundamental things around the economy and the way the economy works changed during COVID um, and started to change probably previous to COVID. And a lot of those sort of deflationary forces that we had out there um, that were keeping inflation in check are gone now. And so I think, you know, while people have now readjusted to that new reality, you know, find me a fund manager. And there's a couple that said it. But the average fund manager was doing the same thing, plowing a bunch of money into tech shares, thinking they'll continue to go up because they have in the recent past. Um, so, yeah, I think it's uh, my personal opinion. And I think the stats back it up as well, is that this is just sort of a sales pitch by the uh, by the industry. All right. We're not getting a lot of questions. Um, we did uh, we did get a question <coughs> that from David, and I know that uh, I think Shawnee or Emily Shawnee wrote an answer, but it is a question about our conference. So David says that he's scheduled to work on the conference day. Um, are you able to access recordings? You are. So all the recordings of our conference coming up in October are, will be available for 30 days. So simply sign up for the conference, and then uh, and then you will get access to all those recordings, and you can watch them in the comfort of your own home. The other thing I would say about our conference is, well, we'd love to have you in person. It's in Sydney at the ICC in Darling Harbor. Um, we also will stream the whole thing as well. Um, so you can attend some sessions from your home, and then of course, watch any recordings that, uh, that you would like to afterwards. All right, well, we seem to be out of questions. We do have a couple comments. Um, so yeah, so Lisa says short term time, uh, short term term deposits are a great interim measure to ride um, to ride through poor market conditions without getting out of the market. Yeah, once again, I, I would just say that, um, you know, if you are making decisions like that to change your asset allocation, you know, that is still kind of moving to cash. Um, once again, it's just sort of thinking about, okay, what would be you know, what would be the driver of you getting back in? Um, so I think people, uh, you know, people like to, people like to talk about, um, I'll get back in when it feels safe. But once again, sort of define that. Um, and once again, looking at your um, long-term goals. So, goals. So Phil says, staying invested for the long-term seems to make sense, but regarding superannuation balances prior to retirement, the imperative is to preserve capital. Um, yeah, no, that is... Uh, that's a really good point. So let's let's talk about that for a second because you know when we make these statements, of course, once again, this is the difference between you know the ability to have uh, general advice versus personal advice. When we make these sort of blanket statements, um, your situation may be very different. And one of the situations, as Phil pointed out, one of those situations, and of course, as you are transitioning into retirement. So, you know, and we talk about this a lot on uh, on various webinars and podcasts and everything else. But one of the big risks that you face as you transition to retirement, something called sequencing risk. And basically what that means, the long and short of it, is that retiring in a bear market is a very challenging thing to do or having a bear market hit right after retirement is a very challenging thing because you are starting to withdraw money, of course, from your accounts and you're selling at the bottom, which of course is another adage that we uh, that we always start talking about. Um, so if you're in that situation, that is when you wanna start looking at lowering the volatility of your overall portfolio. Um, and as Phil said, preserving capital. So make sure, and this is also why you want to set goals. This is why you also want to have a investment strategy that's designed around you and your goals. Because certainly in that situation, you could, uh, yeah, you could want to lower the volatility in your portfolio. You could need to do that. Um, so Peter... Um, so Peter's saying markets are down, central banks starting to raise interest rates will increase. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, that's obviously that's obviously what we're facing here. So if we talk about if we kind of talk about sort of what is uh, what is happening right now that, that Peter is pointing out in his question is, yeah, of course, you know, what rising interest rates generally do is what they're going to do is they are going to change the valuation levels that investors are willing to pay for shares. So, right, as those valuation levels come down, that, of course, is going to bring the market down. The other thing, of course, and the whole purpose of rising interest rates is to slow economic activity. Um, so, you know, you've heard a lot of talk recently around central bankers coming out there and saying that, you know, we need to be prepared to have economic pain inflicted on us. Um, and that is the price of what it's going to take to get inflation under control. Well, that economic pain, of course, eventually translates into earnings. And you've seen a lot of earnings estimates come down as well, um, you know, to reflect the notion of that uh, slowing economy. So, yeah, no, we have seen that, Peter. Um, <coughs> the anonymous attendee says, any evidence for sector rotation strategy do commodities beat broad market in inflationary times? Okay. So yeah, let's talk about let's talk about this for, for a second. So there's a couple different things you should think about. Commodities do generally perform pretty well in inflationary times. Now, there's a little bit of a you know chicken and egg thing here that inflation, of course, a lot of the inflation that we see, and if we go back and we looked at the 70s, a lot of the inflation, sort of where that started was with commodities at the end of the day, right? So a lot of that sort of started, one of the triggers for inflation starting to pick up in 1974 was the Arab oil embargo, of course. And that quadrupled the price of oil. And it basically stayed there um, throughout the decade and then actually went up towards the end of the decade with the Iran, um, the Iranian revolution. But yeah, so are commodities driving inflation and that's why they're doing well? Or do they perform well in inflationary environments? You know, once again, it's a little bit of a chicken and egg thing, but yeah, traditionally they have. The question, and I don't have an answer for this, but once again, if you are making dramatic changes to your asset allocation right now, the question I would ask is, is it too late? You know, we saw certainly a surge in commodity prices is it too late right now? Um, and I don't have an answer for it, but just remember that most of the time when you are making those sort of dramatic decisions to change things, like rotate your entire portfolio into commodities, you're often chasing performance. Um, and just be careful because there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of pitfalls around uh, around that. Okay, so Peter says inflation at 8%, but only applies to spending. Balance of cash is holding purchasing value, if not increasing. So why not hold non invested cash and wait? Um, so I don't, I'm not exactly sure what you're asking there, Peter, but just remember like, you know, inflation, obviously, as prices go up, the purchasing power of your money goes down, right? So while your dollar balance won't go down, what you can get for those dollars is going down. And I don't remember the stat exactly, but you know, if you look at Australia and you know, you look at sort of the inflationary experience that Australia had in the 70s, the 80s, was, you know, averaged over 9% for I think, you know. 10, 15 years inflation. Just remember what that's going to do to every dollar you hold. Um, so it will, in fact, make your money worth less. Of course, the whole point of saving and investing is not just to do it for no reason. It's just to delay gratification, right? You want to spend that money. You just want to spend it later. So just remember that, you know, and I, I'm holding a lot of cash personally, um, but yeah, just remember that you know over the long run you are you are going to see an erosion of the purchasing power and actually makes that money worth less. Um, sorry, going into the other. Um, so Stephen says um, a plan to transition to retirement shouldn't you be moving towards income rather than capital? Um, yeah, so let's so let's let's talk about that. So. Income, of course, is income that your portfolio generates. Um, so whether that is interest, whether that is dividends, um, yeah, you know, certainly something that's very attractive to, for people moving into retirement. I think the question would be, Stephen, is you know what we're worried about 
as we make that transition to retirement. We're worried about how do we actually translate that portfolio into spending. So if you can generate enough income to support yourself and meet requirements, if your money's in superannuation and meet required withdrawals from superannuation, then yes, that is a that is a great thing. That is tricky to do. Um, so, you know, even if we are looking at more income producing securities, just remember that a lot of people often do have to sell things anyway to either meet those government mandated withdrawals or to support themselves in, in retirement. And that's really where we're where we're concerned, um, right? Because you will still be selling in a down market, and that will make it harder, of course, for you to um, ensure that you have enough money to last for all of your retirement. Increases your longevity risk, so basically the risk that you run out of money before you die. Um, so yeah, it all sort of depends. Moving into income also in general makes your portfolio less volatile. So it is a way to sort of dampen volatility. Shares that pay dividends generally bounce around in price less than shares that don't, for example. Um, certainly if you're moving into income security like hybrids or like fixed interest, they are less volatile. So yeah, sometimes it just does it has the same effect, but that's sort of where you need to worry a lot, Stephen, about sort of what your personal situation is, how big is your portfolio, how much income can you generate, what are your spending needs, et cetera. Um, so Craig's saying, any thoughts on when we might start to see earnings revisions downward? So I think we are starting to see them. So certainly as we start to look at um, some of the earnings, we're seeing earning estimates by analysts start to pull back. Um, you know, we didn't really see, I think, in general, if you kind of look at reporting season in Australia, <coughs> and certainly if you looked at um, looked at reporting season in the US, um, that came a month before, generally corporate profits are still pretty strong. I think we all have to realize that the economy is still doing pretty well. That's what central banks are trying to slow, right, by raising interest rates. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of analysts are starting to look out to next year and thinking some of those earnings estimates that they have are a little generous and you're hearing a lot more talk about it. But we'll, of course, see those effects next time earnings are actually reported. Um, yeah, so Lisa's saying when inflation rises and returns drop, important steps to assess personal budgets and adjust spending. So, yeah, absolutely. I agree. That's, of course, the economic um, the economic pain that uh, that we've been hearing central bankers talk about a lot. Um, so Brian says, I'm curious to know how pensions are paid in the U.S. So they have a minimum amount of their private pension accounts take, uh, take each year, like we have mandatory minimums. Um, yeah, so basically works in a couple of different ways. So there is something in the U.S. called Social Security. So Social Security is something that you pay into um, out of every paycheck um, while you are working, and then Social Security gets paid back to you. Um, it's not your money, so it's very different than Social Security. The money actually goes to the government, and then based on all sorts of things, you work out your Social Security payment. So that's kind of fixed, moves up with inflation. Um, and then there are accounts that are like superannuation in the U.S. They are just not mandatory. Um, but yes, they do somewhat work in the same way. Um, so there's something called an IRA um, in the U.S., also 401k kind of rolls into an IRA. And basically it's the same thing as Australia. There are mandates that are calculated based on your account balance and your age that tell you how much you have to take out each year. Um, and then there are different accounts called Roth IRAs where because the taxes are different, you do not have to take money out every year. So yeah, similar. Um, so what Brian's referring to, of course, is the mandatory withdrawal that you need to make from super once you've reached a certain age. All right. We seem to have run out of questions. Um, if anyone does have any more questions, obviously send them through now, or you can email me at mark.lamonica1 at morningstar.com. Um, Lisa says, eat safely. Thank you. I will do my best. Um, but anyway, I hope uh, I hope everyone has a great week. Um, please send me an email if you would like that special rate to the conference. And I know Shawnee, Emily, and I would all love to meet you all in person for once. Um, so hopefully you can all join us at the conference. All right. Thanks very much for joining.
Any advice in this video is general advice or regulated financial advice under New Zealand law prepared by Morningstar Australasia Proprietary Limited and or Morningstar Research Limited without reference to your financial objectives, situation or needs. You should consider the advice in light of these matters and any relevant product disclosure statement before making any decision to invest. To obtain advice for your own situation, contact a financial advisor.